Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. I'll start with the usual report on today's COVID statistics. Uh, the total number of positive cases reported in the past 24 hours was 640. This represents 10.3% of people newly tested and takes the total number of cases now to 29,244. As usual, there will be a full health board breakdown later, but let me confirm right now that 232 of the new cases were in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, 160 in Lothian and 73 in Lanarkshire. The remaining 175 were spread across nine other health board areas. I can also confirm that 137 people are in hospital. That's an increase of 14 from yesterday. 15 people are in intensive care. I reported 14 yesterday, but that was later revised upwards to 16. So today's figure of 15 is actually one fewer than yesterday. Public Health Scotland have also published figures this morning showing that in the week ending the 26th of September, uh, there were a total of 94 COVID admissions to hospital, uh, and that is up from 58 in the previous week. This is a 60% increase in hospital admissions from one week uh, to the next, and it should remind us of how wrong it is to assume that because the recent rise in cases has been driven by the younger population, it is nothing to worry about. That is, in my view, dangerous complacency that we simply cannot afford right now. And to underline that point, I deeply regret to say that seven additional deaths have been registered of people who first tested positive for COVID during the previous 28 days. And the total number of deaths under that measure is now 2,519. That figure of seven deaths is the highest I have had to report at one of these briefings since the 17th of June. It is therefore a very sharp reminder of the fact that COVID is an extremely dangerous virus as well as a highly infectious one. National Records of Scotland has also just published its weekly update as it does every Wednesday. That includes deaths of people who first tested positive for COVID in the previous 28 days, as our daily figures do, but also cases where COVID is a suspected or contributory co cause of death. The latest NRS update covers the period to Sunday 27th September. At that time, we had recorded 2,512 deaths in our daily figures. Uh, today's NRS update shows that at that point, the total number of registered deaths with either a confirmed or presumed link to COVID was 4,257. Ten of those deaths were registered in the previous week, and that is one less than in the week before that. Five of those ten deaths occurred in hospitals, four in care homes, and one was at home or in another non-institutional uh, setting. We, of course, should never think of any of these deaths as statistics. Every single one of them represents the loss of a unique and irreplaceable individual. So again today, as I always do, but uh, given the numbers I've reported today, I want to particularly emphasise this and send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one. And of course, that particularly includes those who have lost loved ones in the past few days. Now, as well as uh, having the Chief Nursing Officer with me today, I'm also joined by Shirley Ann Somerville, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People. Uh, last week, you will recall, I said that we intended to introduce a self-isolation support grant of £500 for people on low incomes who have to self-isolate for public health reasons. Where people who are self-isolating uh, and uh, are well and can work from home, they should, of course, continue to be supported by their employer. And I would ask again today all employers to play their full part in making sure that their employees are able to comply with the self-isolation requirement when they're asked to do so. However, the self-isolation support grant will help people on low incomes who will lose money as a result of self-isolation and who therefore might find it financially challenging or in some cases even impossible to comply unless they have support. And the payment is important because, as I stressed yesterday, self-isolation is important. If you have symptoms of COVID, you should self-isolate immediately and book a test. The symptoms uh, to remind you are a new cough, fever or loss of or change in your sense of taste or smell. If the test shows that you have COVID, you should self-isolate for 10 days from the date of the test. If you are a contact of someone with COVID, you will be advised to self-isolate for 14 days and you'll be told what the starting date for that time period is. 
In some cases, the whole household of a contact will also be asked to self-isolate. Self-isolation is a really crucial way in which we can stop people who have the virus or who might have the virus but aren't yet showing symptoms or aren't yet infectious uh, from going out and about and transmitting it to other people. It is a really important contribution that at some point all of us might need to make uh, to this collective effort against COVID. But we know self-isolation is also really tough in practical ways and of course I mentioned yesterday that we're working with local authorities to offer proactive help to people who need food delivered, for example. But it can be an especially tough thing to ask for people on low incomes, uh, people who might be less able to work from home and maybe more likely to be on zero hours contracts or to have low levels of statutory sick pay. Fundamentally, we must make sure that nobody feels that they have to choose between doing the right thing by staying at home and feeding themselves or their families. So this payment is an important way in which we can help people while they help all of us. And I hope it will enable people to do the right thing at a very difficult time. Now, before I hand over to Shirley Ann, I just want to close by highlighting again our key public health advice. Uh, none of us should be visiting each other's homes at the moment, uh, and that applies in every part of Scotland, uh, except, of course, for very specific purposes, such as childcare um, or to look after a vulnerable person. Uh, and this is the key sacrifice we are all of us being asked to make right now, because it is the most effective way of reducing transmission of COVID from one household to another. So please make sure that you comply with this. When you meet other people outdoors or in indoor public places that are subject to guidance, the maximum group size allowed is six people. And of course, these six people should come from no more than two different households. Outdoors, that doesn't include children under 12. They can play freely with their friends, which is important for uh, the well-being of our youngest children. And the limit of two households doesn't include children aged 12 to 17. They can meet outdoors in groups of up to six but they should still physically distance from one another. By sticking, but sticking with these limits is really important for the rest of us. Um, there are, of course, other steps we should all also be taking to reduce our chances of getting or spreading the virus. Uh, one of the things I want to highlight is that we should think carefully about car sharing. Uh, that's something that's cropping up in test and protect reports. Uh, so you should only share a car with someone from another household uh, if it's essential. And if you do, make sure you're taking precautions. Uh, keep the window open, uh, for example, and wear a face covering. Uh, work from home if you can, uh, and download the Protect Scotland app if you haven't already done so. And finally, uh, remember when you are out and about and interacting with other people, uh, remember facts, the, the five rules which will help us reduce the risk of transmission. So wear a face covering in any enclosed space, avoid crowded places, clean your hands regularly and clean hard surfaces that you are touching, keep two metres from people in other households and as I've already talked about today, self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms of COVID. Keeping to these rules is never easy, it's not easy for any of us, I really do understand that, but sticking with them helps all of us do our bit to stop this virus spreading and from the Numbers I've reported to you today from the picture we're seeing across the UK, Europe and indeed many parts of the world, it should be obvious to all of us of the importance of stopping this virus spreading because we know that when it spreads, it does real damage to too many people. So please uh, stick with this uh, for the sake of yourselves, your families, your communities and the whole of Scotland. Uh, my thanks to all of you uh, for joining us today and for uh, listening as always. I'll hand over now to Shirley Ann to say a bit more about the self-isolation payment and then the Chief Nursing Officer will say a few words before we take questions. Thank you, First Minister. We understand that self-isolation is hard and even if you can carry on working at home, the disruption to daily life is a big ask of people. For those who cannot work from home and know that if they're not able to go to work that they won't get paid, the financial implications make it even more difficult for people to do what is asked of them. So to ensure people do not experience financial hardship as a result of doing the right thing, the Scottish Government is introducing a new financial support package. 
The self-isolation support grant is expected to start from the 12th of October and provide £500. It will be administered by local authorities through our existing Scottish Welfare Fund, which already provides crisis grants to those on low incomes. This has been agreed with COSLA, and I'm very grateful for the support of councils in developing and delivering this scheme. This approach will allow local authorities to align the new grant with their wider work to support for self-isolation. In order to be eligible for the grant, people must have been told to self-isolate through our Test and Protect programme. People who can work from home should continue to do so, and we would expect employers to continue to pay people while they are working. This grant is for those who will face financial hardship due to a loss of income due to needing to self-isolate. So it will be targeted at people who are in receipt of universal credit or of legacy benefits, with some discretion to make awards to others in financial hardship. We're working with local authorities to ensure that it is as easy as possible for people to be able to make their applications and, very importantly, to receive that grant quickly. The Scottish Welfare Fund is an established route accessing funds and there are teams of trained staff and existing systems that will allow us to put this new support in place quickly. It is essential that we can act swiftly so that people who need support are able to access it. We continue to press the UK Government for clarity around consequential funding for the support scheme that they recently announced in England. But given the urgent need to get this scheme up and running in Scotland, we have made a decision on our approach in advance of that answer. Self-isolation is essential to break the chains of transmission of this awful virus and to protect public health. We want to do everything we can to support people through this challenging time and these payments will help ensure no one has to choose between self-isolating and supporting themselves and their families financially. And uh, lastly, Chief Nursing Officer. Thank you, First Minister. Today I want to say a bit about the remobilisation of some of our community services. Now, many of our services have continued to run right through the pandemic. Our, our district nurses, our hospital at home, uh, and our, our general practitioners have been providing a service throughout the pandemic. And Scottish ministers have been very clear that patient safety remains the utmost priority and practices have dealt with urgent non-COVID-related referrals as well as providing essential ongoing care provision. And whilst face-to-face -face appointments have been discouraged at practices for infection control purposes, patients have still been able to get appointments with their GP. GP practices now have Near Me, which is a, a virtual cl clinic option where patients may be able to be seen by their local GP practice on a simple video link or even a straightforward telephone call. With many people being able to access a, a same-day appointment with their GP so that they can be dealt with promptly and, and quickly. And as some services were paused in line with the NHS um, COVID-19 recovery route map, will be restarting. And it will be for individual practices to reassess which patients need to be seen most urgently. Now, many conditions can be uh, looked after. We can look at self-care. And for people who want to have a look at self-care options, then NHS Inform is an ideal option, which is always there. It's updated frequently and regularly, either for COVID or for non-COVID symptoms, to help people look after themselves. And, of course, the general practitioners have been opened. Optometry and opticians um, have not operated fully throughout the pandemic and the Scottish Government has undertaken a phased approach to the safe remobilisation of community eye services, again in line with the COVID-19 recovery route map. Our opticians are now open, safely providing routine eye care services in all settings with appropriate infection control arrangements, including PPE and physical distancing. So people should be confident when accessing their local optician service. It is very important that people have a free, regular NHS-funded eye examination, even if you don't think that you have a problem with your vision. Because as well as testing sight, an eye examination by the optician involves a general eye health check, which can help detect eye problems and other health conditions before they become more serious. So if people do have eye problems, the first contact could be with their optometry practice and the majority of conditions are managed safely and efficiently by your local optician in the high street. And the final service I wanted to talk today was about our pharmacy services, which again uh, have continued to operate and provide an invaluable service right through the pandemic. 
the network, the pharmacy network expanded to the range of services which provided extending the minor ailment service in response to the pandemic and we have now launched the NHS Pharmacy First Scotland service replacing the minor ailment service. It's available to everyone in Scotland and available from almost our 1,300 pharmacies across the network. This new service recognises that our pharmacy teams are very well pleased to manage many common illnesses and symptoms and ensures that the people of Scotland receive the right care in the right place by the most appropriate healthcare professional. Local pharmacy teams are, are open extended hours, they are local and can treat many conditions, typically aches and pains, stomach upsets, indigestion, skin complaints, rashes and other um, minor ailments that people struggle to manage on their own, they can easily access the, the pharmacist for advice. And a very valuable service that a lot of people don't know about is that pharmacists can provide an urgent supply of your prescription medicine if you run out and are unable to get your prescription for your GP at that time. So a reminder, uh, the NHS is open, is, is putting in new services, is looking at remobilisation, and people should not be afraid to contact their GP or NHS 24 if you have any concerns about your, your health and wellbeing. Our hospitals are open, they are running secure COVID and non-COVID uh, pathways so that people are safe and having very, very safe delivery of care right through the spectrum. And we would encourage people not to be afraid, not to step back from services, but to fully engage and contact either your GP or NHS 24 or the other community services that I've outlined here today. Okay, Thank thanks, you. Um, I'll move straight to questions now. Uh, Ross Govins from STV. Afternoon, uh, First Minister. The latest Fraser of Allender report says the economy is likely to be in limbo for at least the next six months. And the UK government's job support scheme is unlikely to protect jobs in the most vulnerable sectors. Is that an assessment you agree with? It is an assessment I would broadly agree with. Um, I should say, first of all, uh, we welcome UK government support uh, as far as it goes. Uh, we absolutely uh, welcomed and uh, hugely supported the, the job retention scheme, the replacement for that, while, as I say, as far as it goes, that is welcome. It's not just me. I think many sectors um, think that it doesn't go far enough and is not on a scale and giving uh, the, uh, the amount of support that will be required given the disruption to the economy that continues uh, to be likely over the next few months. So we will continue to uh, seek discussions with the UK government about how uh, we enhance that support for businesses that are already affected. And of course, one of the conversations I am keen to have with the UK government is how uh, the uh, devolved administrations, either acting together with the UK government or individually, are able uh, to take essential public health measures over the course of the winter um, and have the ability to, to mitigate the impact on the economy. So we will continue to have these uh, discussions and hopefully uh, they will be constructive. But I, I, I think the Fraser of Allender report is a reminder to us that this health crisis, and it is a health crisis, and clearly uh, that is a, a big focus of all of us in, in mitigating the impact of that. But it has created and will continue to create an economic crisis that must also uh, command our focus and the uh, actions that are commensurate to it. Ayla Todd from the BBC. Thank you, First Minister. Um, thousands of students are still self-isolating. Are you confident the, that the outbreaks that have been identified are now under control? Um, outbreaks take more than a couple of days for public health experts to, to give a, a verdict that they are under control. This virus has a up to 14 day incubation period. What I am uh, confident about, but not complacent about, we monitor these things carefully. There are uh, lots of experts uh, in different health boards and uh, nationally uh, working very hard on all of this is that this, the appropriate steps are being taken to reduce uh, risks of transmission and to break transmission chains. And that is true in university clusters, but it will be true in uh, clusters and outbreaks that we're seeing in other settings as well. Uh, one of the things I said yesterday, which I think is really important to underline, and I think the, the figures on hospital admissions and unfortunately deaths underline this point today, is that while uh, we see uh, the recent rise in cases being driven by the younger, healthier population, 
that should not give us any room for complacency uh, because we know transmission is rising across the country and across the age spectrum. We see increases now in the older population and young people can get sick from this virus, um, but they can also pass it on to older vulnerable people who can get sick uh, and die as well. So none of us uh, should feel that this is not about us or that it's not a risk to us potentially. And that's why all of us have to act in the ways that we uh, keep advising people to do. Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, thank you, uh, First Minister. Um, uh, First Minister, um, ITV Border has been speaking to people in outdoor education, uh, which had been a, an important uh, activity, certainly in the, in the south of Scotland. Now, they say the, the current rules uh, will mean that if they don't get uh, something else to do, they don't want a handout, but they want some other opportunities, perhaps say to help schools with outdoor education they say if that doesn't happen their business will crumble can you hold out any hope for them or given the figures that you've announced today are we actually moving in the opposite direction possibly towards even greater restrictions possibly towards what you've described as a circuit breaker which is pretty close to going back to lockdown I'm not going to speculate on future restrictions I, I've been pretty open that we will do what is necessary I've also been pretty open on the the economic constraints that the Scottish Government uh, takes these decisions within. But our focus right now at any point when we are asking people to comply with existing restrictions is to focus on persuading people to do that. And if we all comply with the existing restrictions, then we can start to bring the virus back under control again. Um, in terms of outdoor education, um, I, I know there have been discussions about trying to maximise what outdoor education providers are able to do, um, because obviously there are restrictions on some of what they would normally do right now, um, and that would uh, include helping schools uh, with the provision of outdoor education. I will uh, check uh, later on when I get away from the briefing uh, where these discussions have got to and if they are still continuing and give you some more detail on that later on or ask others to give you some more detail on that later on. But outdoor education providers are important, and of course we want to do everything we can to support them. Natasha Richardson from Bower. Mr. Richard Leonard is calling for an emergency fund to be set up to help with grassroots football in Scotland. We ran a number of stories recently as parts of our More Than Just a Game feature highlighting all the amazing work clubs and their fans are doing to help communities. And I know that's something you spoke to us about at the time and supported as well. Do you think now's the time to give back to these clubs to help them survive? Um, football clubs play an important role in their communities. Um, obviously, football is a, a sport that many people in uh, Scotland follow and uh, are really passionate about. But football clubs, particularly some of the lower league football clubs, you know, do a lot of good work over and above what they do on the, the football pitch um, in those communities. So I certainly recognise that. And during the pandemic, uh, many of them have been doing really important work in trying to spread public health messages and support communities in a, a variety of different ways. And this is a really difficult time and the financial challenges for football um, and, you know, almost for every walk of life right now are are acute. So in principle, yes, I do believe we uh, need to work uh, with those. Stuart McMillan, um, MSP, has raised this issue on a couple of occasions in Parliament um, and is, has been right to do so. Um, and we will continue to look at what the Scottish Government can do. The, the, the comment I'm going to make here is a general comment. And as I keep saying, it's not intended to be a political comment. It's just a statement of fact. Our funding is largely finite. And therefore, if we are to provide financial support over and above what we are already doing, we need to work with the UK government in terms of those funding streams. And to that end, the sports minister in the Scottish government has already raised the issue of football um, and what can be done to support football with his counterpart in the UK government. And I would hope those discussions uh, will lead to some constructive outcomes. Paul Smith from Central FM. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, we spoke to a woman this morning who suffers from COPD. She was sent for a coronavirus test around eight days ago and she's still waiting on her results. Her doctor is unable to see her and won't treat her until the test results come back. When she's called the coronavirus helpline, she was told they're unable to provide the results over the phone because they're so busy. Um, how concerned are you that it's taking so long, well over a week, for people to get the result back? And what would you say to people like Kim and others who may be in that situation? 
Um, I would be very keen if we can get some more details to look into that specific case. Um, generally, yeah, I spoke, I think, two weeks ago now um, about concerns the Scottish Government had about backlogs and turnaround times in the UK government, uh, UK-wide uh, laboratory network. Over the period since then, those backlogs have reduced and the turnaround time has improved quite considerably. I personally monitor this uh, every day. I look at reports in the morning and in the evening to look at how long it's taken tests to come back and, and what the, uh, the numbers that have been uh, delayed for more than 48 hours. We ideally want test results back in 24 hours. Uh, we definitely want as many back as possible in 48 hours. So we look at this carefully and for uh, the vast bulk of tests, that has improved significantly. Um, eight days is you know, clearly not acceptable in any way, shape or form. And I would very much like to think, although I want to look into it a bit more, that that is an outlier and there must be something specific here that has gone wrong. But if you have the uh, consent of the person you're raising this for to pass the details on to us, uh, we will look into that uh, later on. I'll ask Fiona to take that on when we get out of the briefing and you've passed us the details because uh, that, that is not an acceptable period of time uh, for anybody to be waiting for a test result. And just to be clear why it's important that the test results come back quickly, it's important for the individual so that they know whether or not they've got COVID. But it's also important for the test and protect system because it's when a test result comes into the test and protect case management system that the contact tracing starts for positive cases. So clearly, if there is a delay in the test result coming back, there's a delay in that vital part of the journey as well, which we don't want to have. So for individual reasons, but as well as for the performance of our system, uh, we want to make sure that those turnaround times are as speedy as possible. Uh, but on the individual case, I'd be uh, not just happy, but very keen to look into the circumstances of that. But if you want to say any more about turn, uh, uh, turnaround times. I think so. I think, as the First Minister said, the turnaround times have improved. But I think what is important in, in this woman's care is that she needs to be able to access. If you have COPD and you're breathless then and you're concerned about your health, then clearly contacting your GP is the right thing to do. And having further information would be helpful but there are other options for uh, the, the lady to have treatment offered in, in other areas of, of assessment and I think it would be very important that she doesn't fret and is not worried about her health and, and therefore it, it's important that the other options are explored so that she can have symptomatic relief um, if, if that is needed. Okay, thanks. Um, we'll await those details if uh, you have the individual's permission. Um, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Thank you, First Minister. I uh, just wanted to ask again, <coughs> excuse me, about the limitations on mother and baby groups. Um, when we accurately described what the rules are yesterday, you said that they sounded uh, unduly restrictive. Uh, but this five adult limit has been confirmed by the Scottish Government this morning, with a spokesman suggesting those who run the group should simply put on extra sessions. Just given your comment yesterday, what are mums to make of this? Into, uh, when you asked me about this yesterday, and you're, you're absolutely right, I, uh, you did accurately describe it yesterday, I, uh, there, there's no question about that. I, I, I said I'd just been made aware of the, the queries that had come in before I came into the briefing. I had been under the impression that what was being referred to was specific guidance that had been given for mother and baby groups, and that's why I, I wasn't immediately aware of it. When I went to look into it, what I uh, discovered is that uh, this is the general guidance that covers all uh, sort of regulated activities for children and mother and baby groups, although they're not specifically mentioned in that, are included within that. Um, the reasons why there are limits there are the same reasons why there are limits elsewhere. It is to cut down the the, the risks of transmitting from one family to, to another. Um, but I, I know how important uh, mother and baby groups are, so it's important to make two points. Uh, one is that they have not been stopped. Uh, th there are simply limits on the number of people that can uh, attend a particular session. Um, and the, the, the second point, which you alluded to, and I, I wouldn't dismiss this point, we, we will uh, encourage uh, local partners to make sure that if individual sessions are limited in number, they try to have additional sessions so that the same number of people can attend mother and baby uh, groups. And I will uh, you know, look again later on to, to make sure that that uh, work has been taken forward. This is None of these restrictions are easy for people. And, and I, I can imagine for new mums, uh, mother and baby groups are a, a vital uh, you know, source of support. And, and so I don't I don't take this lightly and I don't dismiss how uh, upsetting and 
inconvenient it is it not to, to have that in the same form as before. But we're all you know, having to live with a whole range of different restrictions for the reasons of trying to stop the virus spreading. But what's really important is that as far as possible, ways are found to deliver the same services where they're important services, albeit in uh, a much more uh, or, or a different way. And uh, we'll look further at this to see if there's further uh, work we can do to try to, to minimise the impact on, on new mums. Do you want to add, Fiona? I think, as the First Minister said, there's many, many um, benefits of, of mother and baby or, or parent and, and baby groups in terms of that psychological support, the friendship, people who understand the position they're in, and we know how absolutely important they are. I'm confident the groups that are being run are being run well, have, have safety um, mechanisms in place with regards to cleaning. And what I would say is if there are any uh, new parents who are struggling, then the, the midwife or the health visitor is there and can provide advice and support as well and, and new parents or, or indeed parents of uh, children of any age should not hesitate to access these services for further support. I just think the general point I, I want to, to, to underline here um, is that none of the restrictions, whether it's this one we're talking about or any of the other restrictions that people are struggling with, right, none of them are being done lightly and none of them are being done for no reason. You know, as the figures I've reported today remind us, this is a really infectious virus and therefore we've got to take you know, careful and really tough steps to try to reduce the risks of it passing from one household to another. Because the one thing we do know about this virus, if it gets into a household, it can infect everybody in that household. So trying to limit that transmission is really important, which is why limiting the numbers of people that can come together in groups is a difficult but important way of trying to do that. But I, I do want to stress none of this is done lightly or without a, a great deal of uh, regret and, and consideration uh, going into all of these decisions. Uh, Gina Davidson from The Scotsman. Hi, thank you, uh, First Minister. Uh, new ONS figures have shown that in the three months to July, male redundancies increased by 23%, but women's redundancies by 79%. And that's obviously before the furlough scheme ends. And I know you've, you've said consistently that you're uh, working or trying to get the UK government to extend that, but I just wondered if you had any other practical measures you could take as a government to reassure women in Scotland's workforce that they will not be unduly uh, sacrificed through the Covid virus. Um, Shirley, I know maybe want to say a word or two about some of the, the, the work we do generally to try to make sure that uh, the, the experiences uh, and circumstances of women in the workplace are, are particularly uh, factored into and given uh, due priority in our thinking. A uh, couple of points I would make. Firstly, uh, there has been you know, a, a gendered impact to this crisis uh, in all sorts of different ways. I mean, in the earlier part when, you know, we were talking a lot, um, rightly and, and properly, about care homes and, you know, frontline health workers, uh, not exclusively, obviously, but often disproportionately, the workforce in, in these frontline areas are, are, are female. Um, and therefore, there is a, a gendered impact there. Some of the sectors that we know are disproportionately, all sectors are impacted in some way, shape or form by the pandemic, but some of the sectors that we know are disproportionately impacted will also have uh, a predominantly or, or disproportionately female uh, workforce. Women also uh, still have uh, more of the, the caring responsibilities uh, in the domestic setting than than men do, although I'm, you know, I know that's a generalisation before uh, men watching uh, get, get annoyed at that. Um, and some of the implications of home working, for example, of juggling working and, and childcare will have been, again, not exclusively, but disproportionately borne by women. So we are very aware of that in all of the responses we, we make. Um, on the, the job support issues, you know, that feeds through into the, the reasons why we think welcome, though it is as far as it goes, the support the Chancellor has announced is not sufficient uh, and we will continue to press for that. Uh, we cannot, because of the reasons that I, I keep talking about, the finite nature of our resources, our relative lack of borrowing powers, we can't simply replicate these kind of schemes. So we do have to work to try to persuade the UK government to do the right things. Uh, but where we can, we will always look to do practical things to try to mitigate that uh, impact as much as we can. And on that, I'll hand over to Shillianne. 
Thanks for Samantha. This is a very critical point because although everyone is being affected by COVID-19, not everybody is being impacted in the same way or to the same extent. And the impact on women, as the First Minister um, um, has, has detailed, um, is is quite extreme for some and concerning for some. And that's why, uh, as a government, we've looked very carefully at this um, through a number of lenses. Obviously, the work that Fiona Hislop's been leading on in the response from the Scottish Government to the Benny Higgins report, it specifically looks and challenges to see what more we and others could do to support women going through this process. And the Social Renewal Advisory Board, which I chair along with Aileen Campbell as we work towards renewal, is taking a specific look at the work that we are doing through that gendered lens to make sure that we are looking at every different demographic and challenging ourselves to make sure that we are doing as much as we can. So this is taken very seriously right across um, government to make sure both from the direct economic aspects that we can deliver through our powers within the Scottish Government that we're taking those very seriously and doing as much as we can, but also just to self-check in all our other portfolios that we're making sure that we're challenging where women are being affected, that we're responding to that in particular ways if it requires that to be done. Uh, Tom Martin from the Daily Express. Hi, thank you, First Minister. Um, given the fatality figures you've reported today, um, how prepared should the public be for that to get worse in the coming weeks, given the trends we're seeing? And secondly, um, if I could, you previously talked about um, the restrictions that were put in place in the west of Scotland that have now been extended, um, helping blunt transmission. I just wondered, are you able to, in a position to tell us, you know, what level of blunting has happened or, or how, it's, how, how it is helping? Uh, thanks uh, for that. On, on the first point about should the public be prepared for more people dying? Um, it's a difficult question to answer because on the one hand, I've got to you know, be very clear with the public about the, the consequences of this virus getting out of control again. And you know, many, obviously we know that by the time we are reporting deaths, these will reflect infections that will have happened three, four weeks ago, maybe even longer than that. Uh, so, you know, as infections started to rise a few weeks ago, uh, some of the impact of that we will inevitably see come, come through, unfortunately. But, and this is perhaps the, the more important point I want to make, we mustn't, we mustn't just accept that a rising death toll or a rising hospitalisation rate or a rising infection rate is inevitable. And this is the point... Sometimes, and I feel this as well uh, as a, an individual citizen, this global pandemic of COVID, you kind of feel we're, we're powerless in the face of it. We are not powerless in the face of it. We know how infectious viruses spread. Um, and because we know how they spread, we know how we can stop them spreading. And that comes back down to all of the tough uh, advice that we're giving people, the tough things we're asking people to do, but also some of the really basic things like distancing and hygiene and wearing face coverings. So all of us, each one of us as individuals actually can influence the picture we see in the weeks to come. If we don't abide by these restrictions, if, if we all just go about our normal lives and not take care to stop the virus spreading, then yes, we will see it spread much more and, and unfortunately there will be a, a consequence of that. But if we all do these things, then you know, we can't guarantee we won't get it or pass it, but we massively reduce the risks of that. And we will, as we did over the summer, from a, a, peak, a, a peak that thought, you know, felt at the time as if we were never going to get it down, but we did. Over the summer, uh, we got that down to very, very low levels because we all did the right things. Now, that will be difficult, and more difficult in the winter as we've got uh, fewer restrictions in place than we had in the, the summer, but we can do it. So don't see this as inevitable. Um, it's not inevitable. Um, we've all got a part to play in avoiding transmission, uh, and then all of the consequences that flow from greater transmission. And on the blunting in uh, the west of Scotland, um, we, uh, the, uh, Jason, I think, uh, yesterday uh, touched on this a little bit. So the people who advise me, the experts, uh, are of the view that in the west of Scotland, uh, the household restrictions have uh, blunted the rise in infections that we were seeing when we put uh, those restrictions in place. Now, to be clear, that didn't mean that Infection started to fall immediately, but the, the rate of increase slowed off. One of the things that they are continuing to analyse at the moment, but is complicating the picture, is that 
in the west of Scotland in particular, we have university clusters that are obviously confusing uh, that overall picture. But there is still a very strong view on the part of the people who advise me. And, you know, some of this is, is actually common sense, not complicated uh, public health analysis, is that if we restrict uh, different households coming together in settings where we know people find it much more difficult to comply with all of the physical distancing and hygiene rules, in other words, our own homes, uh, then we'd reduce the virus spreading and therefore it will have an impact in, first of all, slowing down the spread of the virus and then hopefully, we hope, uh, reducing uh, the spread of the virus. So stick with uh, these restrictions, they are really hard, but they are also likely to be the most effective uh, ways that we can stop this virus spreading. Tom Eden, uh, no, sorry, uh, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, I just wanted to follow up from Tom's question, really. I just wondered what your scientist modelling is telling you about what could happen next. Are we going to see the second wave following a different pattern from the first wave? Because we've got... Uh, you know, better testing now, but we're not locked down. Um, so, you know, there are obviously major differences from what happened in, in the spring. And secondly, without committing, obviously, to a particular course of action, I was wondering whether today's figures increase the likelihood of some form of circuit breaker lockdown. Thank you. Uh, on that latter... <laughs> Sorry, on that yeah. latter point, and, uh, and I know you'll understand this, uh, a single day's figures will not in and of themselves influence the... Uh, the actions we take. We, uh, single day's figures are not unimportant. I stand here and report them every day, so clearly we think they're important, but they don't tell you everything you need to know about the trends. We look at seven day averages in the main um, and the trends that we're seeing because single day figures, and you know we've had some of this this week, will be influenced by if there are any holds up and test results coming back or as sometimes happens. Um, and you know, obviously we, we look back to see on a figure like today, whether this will have been an impact where there may have been a technical difficulty that meant that deaths registered in one day didn't actually get reported in time for this briefing. So uh, they may have, uh, they may be reported one day, but being in a previous day, so so we've got to flatten out all of these potential uh, volatilities in single day figures and look at the, the averages over a longer period. And that's what then influences the decisions uh, that we take. In terms of the, the modelling, um, you know, we do lots of modelling. Uh, we, we do uh, modelling looking at what happens if we do X, Y, Z and, and try to, to make balanced judgments. I, I suppose the most, um, the most meaningful thing I can maybe say in this context is that um, and I think we said this last week, uh, we, we reckon based on our modelling that if we do nothing right now, we are, or if we hadn't taken the action we took last week and if, if we just allowed that to continue, we are possibly on the same trajectory as countries like France and Spain, but maybe about four weeks behind them. And so if you look at what's happened in France and Spain, uh, where this increase in cases originally amongst the younger population, started a few weeks before ours did. And people there, as people here, were saying, well, it's the younger age group, we're not seeing hospital cases or deaths rising, we don't have to worry about it. But what started to happen was that the infection went from the younger age groups into the older age groups, and then with a bit more of a delay than earlier in the year, it, but nevertheless, it started to happen, hospital cases started to rise, intensive care cases started to rise, and, and deaths started to rise as well. Not to the same levels, um, necessarily, that we saw earlier in the year, and that comes back to another complication, because in the daily testing figures, you know, we, everybody, and I'm not, you know, it's, it's obvious people are going to do it, people will take figures we're reporting for cases today, uh, the 600 today, and compare them to, to daily case numbers back in March and April. But that's not really valid because back in March and April, uh, the kind of 400, I think it was four or 500 were the sort of highest numbers we reported back then. Uh, they were likely, because we were testing so many fewer people, likely to be a much smaller tip of, of a big iceberg. Our daily case numbers now, because we are testing more people, are likely to more accurately, accurately represent the actual levels of infection. Not absolutely, but more so. Um, so that's why there'll be differences in, in what happens. But I'll come back, because I'm going on a bit long here, um, I'll come back to the central point. As night follows day, if we allow infections to continue to rise, they will go from younger people to older people, uh, 
People in older vulnerable groups will get sick, be admitted to hospital, intensive care and die. And that's the path this virus will take if we don't get in its way and interrupt it. And that's the point. We can interrupt it. We interrupted it in the summer and we can do it again. But that means all of us sticking to these rules and doing all of the things that we're advising. And it comes back to the point I made in response to Tom. We mustn't think that anything is inevitable. This is an infectious virus. It, it thrives when it gets the opportunity to spread and it dies when we take those opportunities away from it. So our job, all of us, is to take the opportunities away from it to spread from person to person and household to household. And if we do that... Uh, because of the time lag, yes, I expect over the next period we will still see these numbers be difficult, but the measures we introduced last week, uh, a month from now, uh, or thereabouts, should start to have an impact on the figures we're seeing if we all stick to what we're being asked to do. Do you want to add anything on that? I think the First Minister has made it very clear about what we can do to stop the transmission of this virus, and I've, I've reminded people before this virus is actually quite easy. A, to kill with soap and water, the, the, the structure of the cell membrane is easily destroyed. And I think the, the challenge, I think, for us in modelling also is that things are different, uh, clearly from the, the young to old that the First Minister talked about. But actually, our knowledge and understanding of how to treat the virus has also greatly improved. And our clinicians uh, are very aware of, uh, of what, how the virus acts. Most people uh, respond well at home, but those who need hospitalisation, those who need um, oxygen, those who need intensive care, there are very simple and straightforward drug treatments such as uh, hydrocortisone and dexamethasone that have made treatments. So the, the clinicians in, in the health system have have learned a lot as well about how to treat and how to respond. So it, it's different. We clearly have a basis, but we have quite a lot of knowledge about how the virus acts. Principally, if we can stop it spreading, that is absolutely the ideal and it's within our, our grasp. But also our health systems are geared up. We, we know a lot more about the virus and how to treat it. And our clinicians are doing an excellent job and an amazing job in helping care for the people who are currently hospitalised and in intensive care. Which comes back to saying what I was saying last week. Uh, difficult though this situation is for us now, we're in a stronger position than we were back in March and April. Uh, you know, we've got better testing, we've got test and protect, we've got better treatments, uh, and everybody over the summer brought it down to a very low level. If we were experiencing what we're experiencing now on much higher levels of transmission, we'd be in a much, much more difficult position much more quickly. So we're in a stronger position, but we've got to, to keep that. Right, uh, we were making brisk progress through these questions until I, until I took about a week to answer that last one, so we'll try and pick up our pace again. Um, Tom Eden from PA. Thank you, Mr. Good afternoon. Um, against the backdrop of the sharp rise in corona cases um, and hospital admissions, I just want to um, chase uh, something Jean Freeman said back on the 6th of July, that work was underway uh, to establish how many deaths were linked to people catching COVID while they were in hospital. Um, has that work been completed? Do you have that number? And have any lessons been learned in the meantime? Um, there's, there's work underway. I, I'll come back to you with a, a specific answer just to make sure I'm getting the right bit of work uh, that you're referring to. So we, we publish figures every week just now about uh, nosocomial infections, so infections that have been uh, contracted in, in hospitals. Um, and I think, I may be getting this wrong, but I think Wednesday is the day uh, they are published. There is also work underway, uh, which Public Health Scotland um, are still, it's, it's quite a complicated piece of work to uh, track uh, the, the situation with people who were uh, discharged from hospital to care homes and uh, whether they were tested before they were discharged, whether they had had COVID before they were discharged. We had hoped that that work would conclude uh, by the end of uh, September, so by uh, now, uh, but because of the, the different data sets that public health that is taking a bit longer um, but I'll come back to you with maybe a bit more detail unless Fiona's got it right now just to make sure we're getting the precise bit of work that you're referring to and giving you the, the right answer to that. No, I think the First Minister is absolutely right about the timing of the report. But So we've not yet had the opportunity to learn from the report, but we have had the opportunity to learn, as I said earlier, about how the virus is transmitted, what protective uh, mechanisms we can put in place, whether it's PPE, days of isolation, days of self-isolation, and, of course, testing. So uh, we've not stood still to protect our, our older population. We've made sure that we've, we've learned uh, from lessons as we have gone along, because this was a new virus, and obviously once the report's published we will be able to examine that and reflect and see if there is more learning we can do to further improve the services we provide. 
Rachel Watson from the Daily Mail. Thank you, First Minister. I just want to touch on that point of a rise in hospitalisations again. And um, this comes as some services within the NHS have been allowed to start reopening, such as surgeries and cancer screening, for example. As winter is usually a busier time for the NHS without COVID in the picture, um, is there a risk that services will have to be reduced again over Christmas um, to prevent a potential rush on the health service? Well, that, that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, and I think uh, I'll, I'll be corrected if I'm wrong about this. So apologies in advance if I am. But I think the Health Secretary is uh, setting out this week in Parliament some uh, more detail about winter planning and the steps that are uh, underway to make sure that the, the health service can cope with whatever COVID uh, might throw at us, but also continue with the remobilisation and uh, be able to cope with other winter pressures um, as well. The, the kind of winter pressures that the health service faces every year, which could come from flu or you know, more people breaking bones in particularly icy conditions. These are things that the health service has to, to deal with every uh, winter. Um, I think that statement in Parliament maybe tomorrow from the, the health secretary. Um, but we're trying to avoid having to pause services again as we're trying to remobilise them. And as I said last week, um, in this pandemic, and every country is in the same position, we can't have 100% normality. Um, so we, we've decided the priorities that we want to have, keeping schools open, keeping the remobilisation of the health service going, protecting care homes and protecting jobs and livelihoods as much as possible. But to achieve those priorities, we've got to do the other things that we keep talking about to stop the virus spreading. Uh, so these are the, the balances and the trade-offs uh, that we are encouraging everybody to make in order that we can keep the remobilisation of the health service uh, underway. But the health secretary, as I say, as uh, I think it's tomorrow, will set that out in more detail in Parliament. David Ball from the Herald. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, a couple of universities in England are offering students in accommodation um, sort of weekly pooled testing. Um, the Scottish Greens are um, appealing for asymptomatic testing at universities to be rolled out, saying it defies logic that it hasn't happened so far. I was just wondering if um, that has been considered by the Scottish Government and if any uh, universities have shown an interest in using their own testing capacity to, to do something like that. Um, Richard Lockhead is, is making a statement on universities, I think, today in uh, the Scottish Parliament and will set out uh, the steps were taken and, and further steps that are under consideration. Um, I, I would... I mean, I, you know, people have their own views, they're, they're legitimate, I'm not criticising, but I, I would, I, I suppose, take issue a little bit with the devise logic statement. We, our testing approach is, is guided by clinical advice, and I won't rehearse all of the arguments here because people have heard me do it many times, um, the, the limitations around asymptomatic testing, which is not to say it never has a role to play. Clearly, we do a lot of it in care homes, uh, but it has a limitation and it is not always the panacea that some people think it is. But how we use testing and how we expand our use of testing is obviously an important consideration in universities as it is across uh, wider society. Um, and we continue to talk to, to universities about that, whether there is a, a role for uh, surveillance testing in addition to the, the substantial amount of testing that is being done in universities, uh, prioritised in line with clinical advice uh, around people who have symptoms so they can be identified, their contacts traced and all of the self-isolation advice uh, given. Andrew Learmonth from The National. If Andrew's not there, I'll go to uh, Helen Puttock at The Times, um, which who is the last question, but I'll come back to see if Andrew um, has uh, arrived after we've had Helen's question. Helen. Yes, Helen. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you. Um, uh, just following on for that last question, I wanted to ask about um, your message to students in the universities, and in particular those who are perhaps having to isolate themselves in accommodation um, when they don't have COVID, but some of their, um, some of their fellow um, students who are living with them or very close to them with shared kitchens do have COVID. Now, how are those students being protected and what's your message to them? My message to students, and I've, I've tried to convey this message um, almost every day over, you know, since the, the latter part of, of last week is, uh, firstly, COVID's not your fault and nobody's blaming you for it. Um, the way students and younger people 
uh, live their lives the way we used to live our lives when we were younger, it means that younger people and students are more exposed to, to the virus than some others. That's not your fault, it's just a, a fact of life. And secondly, I don't underestimate for a, a second how difficult this is um, for students generally, but particularly, I think, for students uh, who are just starting at university and perhaps living away from home for the first time, which is a pretty daunting experience at the best of times, but must be even more difficult right now. So that's my overall message to students. But I, I will add to that, and don't. this is not meant to sound in any way, shape or form unsympathetic, because it's not. But what we're asking students to do around self-isolation is not different to what we're asking everybody in the population to do around self-isolation. The experience of complying with that, yes, is going to be different because of the shared accommodation. But there will be families right now where one person has tested COVID, it tested positive for COVID, and the rest of their household is having to isolate, even although they don't have uh, COVID or they don't yet know because they're not yet displaying symptoms. And they may live in really cramped accommodation in you know, a city uh, setting somewhere. And so it won't be easy for them either. They'll, they'll be self-isolating, having to share facilities, as most of us share facilities in our own homes with other people that we live with. So that's not being unsympathetic to students. This is really difficult, but it is just making the... The, the point that other people are having to do this as well. Um, and often the, the circumstances in which other people will be having to do it are difficult too um, because of the nature of their accommodation, just as it's difficult for students because of the nature of, of where they're living. So this is not easy for anybody. And unfortunately, there are some people in some circumstances where it's even harder than it is for the rest of us. And, and I'm acutely aware of that. And I go back to a point I made earlier on, none of what we're asking people to do right now has been done lightly. I, I wish nothing more right now than I could snap my fingers or wave a magic wand and this would all go away. But I can't do that. And so all I can do is try to work out with all of the people who advise me the best ways we've got individually and collectively of keeping this at bay and then encouraging people, explaining to people why certain things are important and encouraging everybody to do it. And... Don't forget that that collective effort of all of us doing the right things over the summer beat this virus back. Um, now, we were in stricter lockdown. It was in the summer period. It's going to be harder when we're trying to hang on to a bit more freedom in our lives and we're in winter, but it can be done. But it involves everybody, including students, doing really difficult things right now. And I wish so much I could say something different, but that, I'm afraid, is the bottom line that we are living with right now. And the only other final point of... Not to make MD feel better, because it won't make MD feel better, but maybe we should... It helps, I think, to remind ourselves sometimes that it's not just us. Every country in the world is dealing with this right now, and nobody but nobody is finding it easy. And it won't last forever. We should also hold on to that. Uh, and I will now see if Andrew has joined us. Andrew Learman from The National. Uh, thanks, First Minister. Uh, I am here. Yeah, I'm... Uh, the Alzheimer's Society uh, earlier this week, they, they called for this government to recognise the key role that informal care is playing in the lives of people living with dementia. Uh, one way they wanted to do that is by uh, allowing at least one informal carer per household to become a, a designated key worker and have access to training and PPE and testing. Is that something the Scottish government would look at? Uh, the Health Secretary has been having discussions with Scottish care, with relatives of care home uh, residents to look at different approaches to, to get greater normality into visiting and also to recognise an important point that for many people, particularly I think people with dementia, uh, the, the family member visiting them will be doing more than visiting them. They'll, they'll be part and parcel of the essential care that that person needs. But she not an officer might want to say a bit more about that. Absolutely. And I think as as time has progressed and we, we, we close down access uh, for people for visiting into care homes, we're now recognising we need to adjust uh, our, our approach. The virus is still there. Uh, we have a greater confidence about how we can protect our residents in care homes. But also we, we recognise the fundamental essential nature of that relationship. And we are doing everything we can and, and looking at um, many possibilities about how we support that essential visitor uh, to be with their loved one within care homes. And that is, is, is our, our position. It's, it's where we're working on. We're not being deflected um, by the increase in virus. I think we're seeing it as something that's essential for both the family, but in particular the residents' well-being, 
And as the First Minister said, the Cabinet Secretary is working with a wide range of, of people and we're, we're giving clinical evidence and clinical advice and finding ways to do it rather than straightforwardly saying it, it can't be done. So we're working very hard to, to try and make this happen. Uh, thanks very much, Fiona. Um, that concludes the questions today. So my thanks, as always, to all of the journalists uh, and uh, my thanks uh, to uh, Jill for our BSL interpretation to Fiona and to uh, Shirley Ann. Can I just remind uh, people, though it hasn't uh, dominated the questions today, the self-isolation support payment is really important for those who might otherwise struggle financially to uh, comply with self-isolation. So Shirley Ann has given some details of that today. There will be more details available. We'll make sure that that uh, detail is made available through usual channels, the Scottish Government website. Uh, but it's important for people to know that for uh, those on the lowest incomes who will find it most difficult, there will be some support to enable them to do the right thing. Um, can I uh, conclude by thanking you for joining us and uh, just reminding people uh, of the importance right now of all of us doing everything that has been asked of us. Uh, we know it's tough, I know it's tough, I find it tough as well. But the figures I've reported today, while, as I was saying earlier on, single-day figures are uh, not uh, the only things we look at, but the figures we've been reporting over the past couple of weeks tell us that COVID is on the rise. And they also tell us, as I have been uh, saying to people for weeks now, um, and it is now coming to pass, that when the infection is on the rise, it may take a bit of time, but eventually that will feed into people becoming ill and unfortunately dying. But the future is not cast in stone with this virus. We can't magic it away. We, we know that um, it will pass eventually, but right now we can't magic it away. It's there, but we can keep it at bay if we all do the right things. And we know we can keep it at bay because albeit in different circumstances in the summer, we did it then. So please, please remember uh, all of the advice and please stick with it. Uh, don't go into other people's houses right now. The toughest of all restrictions, not being able to visit our family and friends. Um, I do know how tough that is and I feel it as much as everybody does, but it is really important that you stick with that. No uh, visiting each other's homes, uh, apart from the exceptions that I've spoken about. Uh, please uh, remember to work from home if you can. Make sure you've got... Protect Scotland on your phone if that is possible for you and facts in everything you do everywhere you go remember your face covering remember to avoid crowded places if you go somewhere it's crowded leave again remember to clean your hands uh, obsessively uh, take hand sanitizer everywhere with you uh, if you can and clean hard surfaces where we know the virus can hang around uh, keep two meters distance from people in other households again something that is really difficult to do particularly in your own home which is why we're asking people not uh, to visit at all and crucially coming back to the, the central point we've been talking about today if you have any of these symptoms self-isolate immediately and book a test um, and as we will make more detail available uh, you if you need that financial support that will be available for you thank you again for everything you're doing. Um, I will join you tomorrow from the Scottish Parliament for the daily update at 12.20. Uh, that short daily update tomorrow will be followed as usual on a Thursday uh, with the weekly session of First Minister's Questions. So I will see you from there tomorrow and join you here again on Friday at 12.15. Thanks just now.